-hmm. so, um, so here's the deal. This presentation originated as a mitzvah. Now, for those of you that are not Jewish and don't know what I just said, basically it's a Jewish term for loosely translated doing something nice for somebody else without having any kind of expectation of getting something back in return. That's the purpose. See, a friend of mine many years ago approached me and he said, David, I don't know what you're doing when it comes to networking, but it just seems it's so, I don't have to hold this anymore, it just seems that it's so easy for you, and yet it's miserably unproductive for me. It doesn't work. He said, my family's depending on him, on my business, my business is depending on networking, I can't make it work. And then I look at you, it's like you're just gliding along. Like it couldn't be any easier. Like the word work shouldn't be in, in, in that definition of the word. What are you doing that's so different than me? And more importantly, would you teach me? And I, at first I was kind of taking it back. I was thinking, I didn't think I was doing anything that was different. It's just my ways. I'm intuitive. I've kind of learned. If you drop a bowling ball on your foot, it hurts. Don't do it. So I don't do those kinds of things. My thought process is simple. If something works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, don't do it twice. That doesn't make me a genius. Full disclosure, I was dead last in my class, in my, in my graduating class from high school, out of 106, 106 kids. Now, I did go to a school where there were a bunch of Olympians, effectively, in brains. But I was dead last. I didn't realize I was actually okay on the smart scale until I got to college. College was easier after high school. Anyway. That's relevant. But in any case, <laughs> I got a really weird sense of humor. So here's the deal. What ended up happening is by helping my friend learn how to network and do what I do that's so easy, he then turned around and said, hey, these are some pretty good ideas. Would you be willing to share them with a group I belong to? And I said, do you think anybody would be interested? And he said, yeah. Actually, no, he said, hell yeah. <laughs> so three weeks later, I'm in front of a group of people. I didn't have this presentation. I didn't have a PowerPoint. And he just stood and talked about my ideas. And he said, boy, this is really good. And the phone started ringing. And I got opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to do this same talk at corporations and insurance companies. And the schools started calling and non-for-profits and all kinds of places. And it, I'm doing it for free because I love it. Guess what? I started getting paid to do it. So that's how the mitzvah came back. I didn't try to help my friend because I was trying to make money. I was trying to just help him. And that's how this happened. Now, none of the things I'm going to say to you today are rocket science. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this and do it. It's really simple stuff. Except, none of you are doing it. I mean, none of you are doing it. Because if you were, you wouldn't be in here. So here's the thing. The average person has never been trained on how to network with others. We are in a school. This would be a great place to have a course on learning how to network with other people, I think. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great undergrad or graduate school class. Anywhere, <clears throat> raise your hand if you've, ever, if you've ever taken a course in any accredited institution how, how to network with other people. Now, I don't mean social networking. Boots on the ground, networking. Raise your hand. Nobody. Why is that? Because no one's actually thought you should be trained. But everybody does it. What do you think would happen if you knew what to say and what to do? Or more importantly, what not to say and what not to do when you're interacting with other people? You think that'd help? I think so. So here's the next thought. Why do people get it wrong? It's because you're facing the wrong way when you're talking to somebody. Imagine you're, I'm talking to you, and then I turn my back to you. Well, that's not going to be kind of, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same thing. People think that networking is about getting something. And they've forgotten it's about giving something. Except they don't give something. They just think of it, I'm going to get something from this person. I'm going to extract information, opportunities, or something. I'm not giving them anything. I mean, why else would you go to a networking group with a stack of cards in your pocket? Because you never know who you might meet. I might get something from it. Wrong way to think. Take the brain, disconnect, turn it 180 degrees and plug it back in. Now you're thinking correctly. You're going to walk backwards, but at least you're going to think correctly. <laughs> okay? Next. So here's the thing. 
Most people look at networking as a means of shepherding contacts towards them. They're just trying to get as many people. It's a contact sport. You talk to as many people as you can, any way that you can. It doesn't even matter who they are. Just get them talking. That's not networking, people. Next slide. This is networking. Stand in one place. Don't move and watch what happens. People are attracted to you. I don't know if any of you realized when I was downstairs while you were having lunch, I didn't move. Now why is that? Because I wanted to be the, the central point of the room and people would rotate around. They would subconsciously remember he's there. I might not talk to him, but they're going to somehow, just like a whirlpool, it all comes back into the center, be in the center and don't move. They will have to walk past you. They will be interested in coming to speak to you at some point. If they have an interest. If not, not. But the point is you stand in one place and let them come to you. It's the same way in networking. Imagine you are that single source of light within your network that everybody sees. Let me give you the analogy. Imagine I was giving you a mission to capture as many bugs in your yard as you could. How would you do it? Get some fly paper and a net, run around the yard and try to swipe at them? Me. See, I would have a nice barbecue out on my back deck. I watched the sun go down over the trees. And only after it was completely dark, I'd wander into my garage, get an extension cord and a light socket and a single light bulb, walk out of the yard, and just turn on the light. And the bugs will be zapping me. Right? Just wait until the summer time. That'll happen. Or if not, just walk outside and come eat you. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying. You want to be that single source of light within your network. And so all of this sounds like a great thing to do, right? It's a nice idea. Great. How do you do it? It's actually not that hard when you break it down into its fundamental components. And the goal of my presentation is simple. It's to arm you with all of the information you're going to need to create the proper foundation for engineering for improving your networking activities that is simultaneously highly effective and highly efficient while providing you with the rules of engagement. You're surprised I could actually do that without even reading it. It's only because I've been doing it a lot. It's simple. There are rules to developing relationships with people. Here's how I can prove it. Next, next one. Any of you ever been on a date, or currently married, or been married before? Raise your hand. Okay, so you're all experts in developing relationships with people, right? Here's a hard question. What makes them fail? Lack of communication. Among other. If I'm a, a, an engineer, and I'm designing the Tappan Zee Bridge, I know precisely how much each component can take in stress before it breaks. How about a relationship? If you don't know where that breaking point is, you will find it. And you'll probably find it at a time that you don't want to find it. So, it's simple. If you understand what makes a relationship fail, you're more likely to understand what's going to make a relationship succeed. And I don't care if it's a friendship, a business relationship, your spouse, your family. <clears throat> I'm telling you, you have to understand this stuff. Communication is a big piece. Honesty is a big piece. If someone says, how do you think? Do you think I, I, I look good? You better tell them the truth. Because if you say, honey, you look great. And meanwhile, they walk out and everyone's like, I can't believe you're wearing that. And then she goes, why didn't you tell me? Oh, you really want me to be honest? Yes. It's refreshing to actually tell people the truth. Wow, that's rocket science there. <laughs> now. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. It's a movie that maybe you've, you've seen, maybe you haven't. And they talk about the ABCs. Now, they're talking about sales. Always be closing. Are you going to tell me that there's not some aspect of sales in developing relationships with other people? Please tell me you say yes. Because anybody who's been on a date, you're presenting a side of you that doesn't exist. <laughs> Once you get married, oh, there's the truth. It showed up. And when you're married 20 years, it really showed up. That's the deal. It's really the deal. Here's, uh, back it up once. 
Here's the deal. When you're looking to develop relationships with people, it's really, really easy. Tell them the truth. You don't have to hide behind it. And on top of that, I can save you a ton, a, a ton of time with a therapist and a lot of money. You don't have to make your boat payments. If you just simply explain to the person you're talking to something that they don't want to hear, look, I don't want to make you upset. I'm about ready to say something you probably don't want to hear, but understand it's coming from the right place. I'm just trying to figure out how I can help you in a little bit. Are you okay with that? Get permission to, to ask that question. They say yes, you've got permission to go. That's All you're trying to do is improve that, that communication style. And I don't care who you're trying to talk to. It's really that important. Can you repeat that question again? If you're trying, I'm not trying to rephrase it. If you're trying to, to make sure that a relationship thoroughly develops, tell them the truth. Ask them permission. If you're going to ask them something that might make them feel uncomfortable, get permission from them first to, to, to say that. If they give you permission to say, I might say something here that you might not want to hear, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Are you okay with that? If the answer is yes, you've got permission. And that's how you can further a relationship down the road. Now, the networking process, as far as I'm concerned, is like a vetting process. I could have a different picture of that, you know, kind of like a filter, a coffee filter. But in the end, we have lots and lots of acquaintances. People that we might know by sight, maybe we have their first name, we really don't know anything about them. Your best referral is not coming from them, ever. The next level down, we have more of what I call friendlies. Now, if you're in the military, a friendly is somebody that you technically have a common goal to, but you wouldn't trust them enough to hand them your gun and turn your back on them. Right? Okay. So, if you're in networking, that's someone that you have some chemistry with. Maybe they make you think. Maybe they challenge you. Maybe they make you angry. Maybe they, they're violently Democrat, you're violently Republican. And you just, you cannot get together on that. But maybe that interaction is something that you both enjoy. Who knows? The point is, there's got to be some type of chemistry there that leads you to say, I want to get to know this person better. That's a friend. Your best referral is not coming from them either. Your best referral is... Oh. <laughs> Your best referral is going to come from your friends. So how do you systematically graduate acquaintances to becoming friendlies to becoming friends? You don't have a process yet. You don't even have the questions. You don't have the vernacular yet to do that. But you will by the time I'm done. See, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a, a, a picture in your mind so that you can understand this. Imagine it's about 3 o'clock in the morning, um, pouring rain, a little bit of a wet snow thrown in there, too. There's a fire going on. Family's out in the street, barefoot, soaking wet, all huddled together trying to stay warm. The sirens of the fire trucks coming up the street. The neighbor up the street hears the sirens, looks out the window, sees the fire, jumps out of bed, gets in his car, and flies on down the street. And all he does is he says, get in my car. I'll take care of you. It's warm and dry here. That's what a friend is. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for people who think that way. They, they're not looking for a favor. They're not looking for you to do something for them. They just say, I'm just going to volunteer. I'm stepping up and take care of you. Now that is where your best referral comes from. Without question, every single time. You have a raving fan with someone like that. A book you want to read. That's what you're looking for. So, what you're going to get with a friend is a referral that you didn't ask for. Because if you attempt to ask for a referral, hey, could you please refer me to this person? It's never going to work. But if someone says, wait a minute, I know what your situation is. I've got just the person who can help you. I know exactly who you need to talk to. And here goes their sales pitch pitching for you to talk to that other person. By the time that person's done, the person who needs the help wants to meet the person who can provide the help. They're motivated. The person who can provide the help is also motivated because they want to help. Everybody wins. What are you trying to be? The Jewish grandmother at a bar mitzvah. 
Because you know how that goes. Grandma comes over and says, all right, boy, girl, sit, talk. That's how it goes. Well, if you've never been to a bar mitzvah, you won't know, but that's how it is. That's how it works. I'm sure it's like that. like that in every religion, but that's how it works. So that's what you're looking to do, is get a referral that is volunteered. So, in order to make this work even better, your philosophy, your attitude, they all have to be wired straight. No AC current here. I want it just one straight line, parallel. And the reason that that's important is because we have to define what networking is. Is networking supposed to generate something for you? No. No. You say that now. We should have said that five minutes ago. <laughs> so, right. Ideally. Ideally? Okay, now you're being honest. It's great. Ideally. Why else would you go to an event with a whole stack of cards to do that? Oh, well, I, uh, I might need somebody. I said that before. I'm saying it again because it's important. Next one. This is my definition of networking. Networking is intended for me to meet new people in which I might develop a relationship with them for the sole purpose of helping them. Do you see the stark difference? Read the differences. One is just for me, the other is for everybody else. The literal translation of my last name, Volkman, actually means man of the people, just by accident. <laughs> but we can all be that person. There's nothing stopping this. Doesn't matter what your religious background is, doesn't matter what, male, female, old, young, doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. Next. What am I really saying? You gotta be a mensch at the core. Another Jewish term, let me translate. It means being a good guy. Be, be a good person. But purely from your heart, just be pure. I want to help you. I have no other agenda. I don't have an axe to grind. I'm just purely trying to help you. It's a refreshing change in this cyber world that we're living in right now. Shouldn't be, but it is. So, here are the core elements of what I'm talking about. Really, <laughs> help somebody else first. If, in the process of helping, with somebody, helping someone else, you don't get the dopamine drip, which is the pleasure center, you're already dead. <laughs> it's simple. If opening a door for another person doesn't make you feel good, it's already too late. If going out of your way to try to help somebody doesn't make you feel good, it's already too late. Only after you've done number one and two could you ever hope that at some point it will come back to you. Okay? So, what type of referral are you looking for? You want that? Here's a person's name and number. Don't tell them I told you to call. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've heard that before. So I actually heard this many times for years where someone said, hey, this is a moving company. I hear those people are going to be moving next month. You might want to call on them because if they're going to move, maybe they'll hire you. That's not a referral. That's a waste of time. It'd be better if you actually made the introduction of the conversation. Here's the next thing. Here's my name and number. Tell them I told you to call. Yes. Tell them I referred you. Now that's how everybody does it. Right? Mm -hmm. Not after today. <laughs> that ends here. My idea is you want to tee up the referral in such a way that you are literally transferring the equity of one relationship to another person. And you're doing it in a very powerful way where they feel highly motivated to work together with you. That's what you're literally doing is taking hands and putting them together. That's how you make a referral happen. And I mentioned this before, like being like a Jewish grandmother, it's the same idea. It's the same idea, just trying to literally, almost forcefully, you're a person in need, you're a person in help, I want to bring you together. And I don't even care how. You, you need to work together. And here's why. This person is going to be the best thing that's ever happened to you. Here's why. All these reasons. And they're going to be like, wow, is that a paid endorsement? No. That's how much I care about this person. When's the last time that's ever happened? So, here's my example. 
Many years ago, my friend Richard called me up and he said, David, I don't know if you can help, but I've got this terrific business idea. I've got everything figured out, except I can't get any money from the bank to start my business. Now, this is around the financial crisis, so I said, well, that's great. I guess the Federal Reserve is working out just perfect. <laughs> Isn't this great? Can't get any money for a business. Well, so I said, are you coming to me for money? He said, no, 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 no. I wouldn't be that presumptuous. But you know a lot of people. Maybe you could connect me with somebody who could help. And so he got off the phone. And he was feeling a little down. He wasn't quite sure if I was going to be able to help. And I thought for a minute, oh, I'm going to call a friend of mine. And so I called him. And I said, hey, I got a, another friend who's got a business who needs help. Do you have any contacts in the, in the venture capital space? And he said, yeah, hang on a second. He gets conference on his phone, dials his friend Michael. Michael gets on the lines, and, and, and my friend introduces me to Michael. We end up ha uh, having a discussion, and right before he gets off the phone, he says, hey, one of the two of you uh, give me a call afterwards and let me know how this went. Hangs up the phone. Now I'm talking to Michael. He's in the venture capital space. We don't know each other yet, but we share the same friend. So that was the common, uh, common connection there. So what ended up happening, he talked about his business for a couple minutes, I talked about mine for a couple minutes, we got right down to business, I told him everything I knew about my friend Richard, and what do we have? He says, drum roll please, any chance I can talk to your friend Richard, I'm really interested. He said, I said, sure, absolutely, hang on a second. I hit conference on my phone, I dialed my friend Richard. I said, hey, guess what, I got a new friend named Michael, he's in the venture capital space, he's interested in your business, will you have time to talk to him? What I heard on the other end of the phone was the crash of a cereal bowl hitting the floor <laughs> and squeals that I thought came out of his 50 year old daughter. <laughs> and he said, you all right? He said, yep, I'm good. I said, I'm going to get off the line now. One of the two of you give me a call afterwards and let me know how this went. Click. And an hour later, I get a call from Richard. He is weeping, happy. I mean, one of those deep, guttural cries. He said, I cannot believe you did that. He wants to fund my business. While wow, he's crying. <laughs> Is there anything I can ever do for you? How will I ever repay you? Right then, Michael calls me on the other line, and he says, I can't believe you did that. i got to get on your calendar. i, I, I got to talk to you some more. I said, well, if I can call you back, I'm feeding oxygen to Rick right now. <laughs> Followed up, Rick then is just really, he's, he's a mess. Because he's so thankful. And he says to me, how can I ever refer you to somebody else? What shall I do? How can I help you? What can I do for you? I, name, whatever you want. Now you think there's a chance on this earth that any other financial advisor is going to get, get between me and my friend Richard? No. Never. Uh-uh. He's going to traffic for me. As I would for him. That's what I'm talking about. And you only do that by building goodwill. What I've created was an accounts receivable list. It's an IOU. And when you do that, you better be prepared to answer the question of what can I do for you? Well, here comes my five second elevator pitch. Can you explain what you do with three components in five seconds or less where the answer, where, where someone will hear what you have to say and have nothing but questions about what you do. If you can't do that, you have homework to do. Here's my five second elevator pitch. It's intended to get you to ask questions. I'm an independent financial advisor. I help organize my clients' finances and get them to a better place. How do you do that? So what do you do? Thank you. What does it mean to be independent? What does it mean to organize someone's finances? And how do you get people to a better place? Thank you. That's a conversation starter. But I've at least shared enough information so that you're interested. And if you're not, you're not. But it's a universal thing. So, are you extroverted or introverted? Okay. Would you believe that I was once... Severely introverted? Yes. I, this is a learned behavior. I have learned to do this. It's okay. Keep that up. These are my kids. Thank God 
they are not introverted. They, look they are very <laughs> extroverted. Especially <laughs> this little guy. Wow. He is something. The point is, some people say, I have uh, survived a heart attack. Or I have survived cancer. I survived, as an eight-year-old, a horrible, horrible divorce as an only child. Horrible. Like, if it was today, it would never pass. Nobody would have to go through what I did. I was the picture of depression, suicide, and being a loner. My idea, put it this way, I was eight years old and I was in a hallway not too different from this, and I remember kids, they just pounded me. They dropped my books on the ground, they pushed me to a wall. I stopped fighting back. Because that was actually less painful. That was me. I have learned, the first time I ever had to speak in front of other people, I was in high school, I was 15 years old, I stood in my speaking class, there was a podium, all I had to do was read a paragraph. I got to sentence two, passed out cold, on the floor, oh. out, like out cold, anxiety done. Couldn't do it, couldn't even look people in the eyes. And now, I can do this. This is a learned behavior to be able to do this. So if you are introverted, here's the lesson, if you are introverted now, you don't have to be imprisoned by being introverted. You can learn to be extroverted. It's hard. It's like climbing up Mount Everest with no jacket on. Barefoot. It's hard. But I've done it. It can be done. Next slide. So, how do you explain what you do for a living that doesn't sound like a sales pitch? Everybody struggles with this. Everyone. I mean everybody. How many times have you been to some event somewhere and you make the mistake of asking, what do you do? <laughs> 20 minutes later, because oh. they haven't figured out they've been talking for 20 minutes. And they've told you everything, including where the broom is in their office. Where the bathroom is, I mean, they told you everything in the most excruciating detail, and you still have no idea what they do. So how do you explain? Yeah, you learn all kinds of things, but the, not the things that you need to learn. And so the point is, how would you explain what you do for a living that doesn't sound like a sales pitch? That's a lot harder to do than you think. It takes a lot of work. Next slide, yeah, there you go. So, the FBI, CIA, DHS, NSA, D, uh, DEA, Secret Service, Israeli Defense Force, uh, oh, I don't know, the English, the Russians, and anyone else that you can think of, guess what? They know that body language tells everything. Everything about what you're thinking. You can say whatever you want, they can profile you and like that, whether you're a threat or not. They can tell whether you're telling the truth or you're not. You want to be an expert in body language right now. I saw things downstairs and even throughout the day today that if people saw themselves on camera and they realized what they were actually communicating, they'd be embarrassed. I love people watching. And it's really neat to see it because you can kind of get a, a, a feel of what's going on. Whether their head is tilted to the right, to the left. How are they holding their hands? How are they standing? Which legs crossed over what? When they're going out to go shake somebody's hand, are they pushing off with the right leg or the left leg? It actually means something. There's a whole science to this. Um, yeah. There are strategies to this. Here's the first thing, hand gestures. You ever wonder why when someone says, I surrender, they do this? It's partially to show that they don't have a weapon in their hand. But chimpanzees do it. Now, why do chimps do it? Because they want to say, I'm not a threat. So, if you're out there in the world, I'm not suggesting you do this all the time. <laughs> I am suggesting have your hand gestures more up and more forward where there's a chance that they can see the palms of your hands. You're sending the right types of psychological signals. If you're showing the tops of your hands, it's a go away function. It's a threat function. Think of it that way. So, in your hand gestures, make them 
very malleable. I'm not saying you do like like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders where he does this with his hand. That drives me crazy. Right over the edge. Oh. And I'm not suggesting you do like Trump does where he's always doing this like he's yeah. orchestrating. That's not what I'm saying. This is what I... Oh, oh. Someone's got to tackle him. The point is, is that be aware of your body language. Some of the best speakers you've ever, you probably have never seen, go on TED Talks. Yeah, just see some, I don't even care what you're looking at. Just go on TED Talks and put in any topic that you want and watch some of these people. Some of them are really good. They're really, really talented. You want to see how they hold their hands. How do they hold their body? How do they stand? How do they walk? How do they stop and stand still? What's their facial expressions? It really matter. Hand gestures are a big thing. I saw lots of people doing this today. You know what that means? Buzz off. <laughs> I'm not interested. Here's another one that's even worse. Go away. <laughs> right. Then there's the collegiate. <laughs> Arms down, elbows by your side, hands loose and in front of you. If you're going to stand in one place, do this with your hands. Maybe not like that because you look like Secret Service. Well, maybe I do. But, you know, hands like this. Do not do this kind of stuff. Because although you might not realize it, they're thinking, what are you going to punch me out? You're sending the wrong message. Psychologically, you're sending the wrong message. Body posture. I'm not suggesting that you stand like Superman. I am proud. Nope, no, no, no. But I'm also saying you should not be doing this. I feel down in the dumps. Have a little air in your diaphragm. Male, female, doesn't matter. Just stand up tall. Not shoulders back, but just comfortable. Stand up tall. It's sending psychological messages to the people that you're talking to and even the people you're not talking to because they can sense it. Eye contact. Have you ever been talking to somebody? And they lock eyes on you, and they will not let go. It's <laughs> two seconds. And I'm not going to let go. So it's so uncomfortable. Like, right, you see? That's what I'm talking about. You look like a stalker. So force yourself. I mean, sometimes people get really excited, and suddenly you start seeing the whites in their eyes. Be calm about it. I know you're excited to, hear what, to say what you're going to say. They might not be as excited to hear what you have to say. So look away after two to four seconds. Force yourself to do that. Slow down. Now, if I can do the questions after, that'd be awesome. Oh, it just has to do with the eye contact thing. Yeah. Like a, a little trick. Yeah, all right. If I can, because I have limited time. Okay. okay. Um, next one, please. Your eyes tell the truth. Now, those of you with kids, how many times have you asked your, your son or daughter, did you do that? And they do this. Well, <laughs> if they're looking up and to the right, they're probably going to tell you the truth because they're accessing the left part of their brain. If they say, well, I'm looking up to the left, they're accessing the right side of the brain, that's the creative <coughs> side. They're coming up with a story. <laughs> mm. Any application with adults? You bet. Because we're only older versions of kids <laughs> with mortgages. Thanks. Next one after that, and one more. Facial expressions. Now, my, one of my favorite comedians is George is, is Lewis Black. You might not like him. I do. He's angry comedy. I love it. Works for me. He does the whole thing on George Bush, the younger, where he says he could be talking about something that's really, really terrible, but he'll do it with a smile on his face. Mm. If you got a bad topic or an ugly topic, have a frowny face. If it's a nice thing, have a smiley face. How many times have you talked to somebody and you've made the mistake of asking them, so how are you doing? And they say, I'm doing terrific! Whoa! How are you doing? Dial it down. I only asked you how you're doing. I didn't want to get tackled. <laughs> Next one. Bad breath. Whew, this is a good one. <laughs> have you ever been talking with somebody and their breath is so bad that you can't see how your eyebrows will still be on your face. <laughs> because they just had some red wine, they just had an alcoholic drink, and it's whiskey, or worse, they had some type of a spinach canish or a big in, the, big in a blanket kind of thing, and their breath is terrible, especially if they're a smoker. 
Mm. Bad news. Be very aware of your breath. You might not think it's bad. It's worse than you think. <laughs> and if they're within three feet, they can't deal with it. They can't even hear what you're saying. It's like, go away from me. <laughs> Beware of that. Very, very much so. Next one. Attire. Now, for men, it's pretty easy. Look neat and orderly. And dress more like the way everybody else is who's a, who's a man. Women, on the other hand, have all the power. All of the power. I have been in conference rooms with everyone being a married man or a married woman, and I've seen an attractive woman walk in who's dressed just a hint of sexy. And I'm telling you, this is what happens. Guys, do this. <laughs> Every time. Every single time. Women, you can kind of tell there's a little tension there. It's a biological response. It doesn't mean that the men are looking to uh, cheat on their wives and the women are. It's not like that. It's a biological response. Women hold the power. So the, what the, the lesson is, be intentional with what you wear. It could send either the right message or the wrong message. Just be aware of it. Next one. <coughs> Proper handshake. Now I need a victim. All right, I'm going to pick you because you're here. This isn't going to hurt very much. Okay, I'm going to give you some handshakes and you tell me what I'm doing. Okay. I just did it. Yeah. Dead fish. Yeah. I didn't even grab your hand. Yeah. I'm not interested. Here's this one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's the used car salesman. Yeah. Come on now! I got something for you! Alright, here's another one. Oh, oh. I'm in here. Yeah. I turned her hand oh, yes. this way. It's just as bad. I was just going to say that. Are you going to kiss it? But sometimes you see politicians, they'll do this, or they'll go for the elbow. Yeah, though. Because they're trained to do that. So here's the proper handshake. Because I don't think anybody's ever been taught this. You ready? Because no one taught me. I learned it on my own. However hard you would hold a grapefruit like this without it falling out of your hand, that's how hard you're going to squeeze. Keep your fingers together like that. You're coming in at a 45 degree angle. I'm aiming for, I'm visually looking for the, the webbing in her hand. And I'm going to come in at a 45 degree angle, squeeze my hand around. I'm going to shake a couple of shakes. I'm going to face you square up. Look you square in the eye. And we'll, we'll nod. That is the right way to do it. Nobody gets it right. None of this slack handshake kind of stuff. None of this bro hug kind of uh, crap that's out there. Uh -uh. Just, that's a proper handshake. And here's another thing. If we're going to have a conversation, mm -hmm. is this too far away? Yes. Okay. Is this too close? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What's the proper distance? Right here. 18 to 24 inches. That's the proper thing. And I want to be facing her at a 45 degree angle. Why? Two reasons. One, it invites others to the conversation. It also gives me a foot out if I want to go. <laughs> the second thing is, right. sometimes when they're, people are really excited and talking, and sometimes you can get a little flyer. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if, if I'm facing her and that happens, yeah. it's just hit me. Yeah. If not, it hit that person standing right there. <laughs> that too. Thank you for playing. You can also see that attractive woman as she's coming into the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and next one. And one more. Okay. Guys, keep the bar language and sports talk someplace else. It's just that simple. No cursing. Be very aware that other people can hear what you're talking about. Be aware that not everybody's going to be interested in the topics you're talking about. So right now, politics is a big thing. Limit. I don't care how passionate you are about whoever your candidate is. Not a conversation point. It can make things uh, very troublesome. Next. Conversational quality. My grandfather taught me this a long time ago. You've got two ears for a reason. Use them twice as much as your mouth. If you're talking too much, shut up. <laughs> Ask questions of somebody else to get them to talk to you. Next. If you've gone to an event and you're talking to somebody for longer than 10 minutes, you've talked too long. Disengage. Ask for their business card and say, 
I think there's something here. We've got some something going on. I'd love to learn more about your business. I would like to be able to spend more time with you, but I don't want to occupy your whole night. Can I get your business card? Can we set up a time to be able to meet after this event some other time? Yes, of course they're going to say yes. That's what you're shooting for. Next. If they don't get it, disengage with them. How do you do that? Yeah. I'm going to get to that in okay. one second. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they most, think you're really interested. And I understand. Rules of engagement, most people don't know. And for goodness sakes, don't ask for someone's business card. Uh, excuse me, don't hand out your business card until they've asked for it. No matter how interested they seem, never hand it out unless they've asked for it. Why? Because you're looking for a piece of data. Because if I just handed it to them right up front, and then they walk away, I don't know if they're actually still interested in talking to me. But if at the end, when we're clearly parting ways, hey, can I get your card? Guess what? They're interested in speaking to you again. That's what we're looking for. You've got permission now to speak to them again. Next. The goal of any marketing is to grab someone's attention for some period of time, hold it, and then give them a call to action so that they can go ahead and do something. That's the point. I don't care what your marketing is. For any business, in any medium, that's it. That's all we're trying to. And that's what networking can do. Next. Here are your four questions. Next one. You gotta plan what you're gonna say. If you don't know what they do for a living, ask them, what do you do for a living? But if you do know what they do for a living, ask them this. What do you like about what you do for a living? I guarantee you they haven't been asked that in probably a decade, maybe ever. They're going to remember you just because you asked that question. Next one. What makes your phone ring? I'm asking what just happened prior to someone thinking, oh, I need this person's services. Look at the phone number. Hey, uh, can you help me? If I had fired my house, I'd dial 911 and the fire trucks come. So I want to know what just made your client's phone ring to call you. That'll help me figure out how to refer you. Next one. What are your centers of influence? Who are the people that refer you new business? Now, I'm not saying by their name. I mean, what's their industry classification? And if you don't know, you've got homework to do. You better know that. Last one. How could I best introduce you to someone else I know? Mm. Has anyone ever asked you that? Mm. Has anyone ever asked you, if I was going to introduce you to someone else that I know, how would you want me to do it? You probably haven't thought about it. So you think about it, and then you ask these questions to the people you're talking to. Just the fact that you're asking these questions will be such that they'll say, ooh, I'm interested in this person more. Next slide. This is clearly how you disengage. If they don't get it, pick up your cards and go. <laughs> a guy that I met many years ago who had this look of being successful like a CEO, he just reeked of CEO, and I was at an event, and I'm like, man, I gotta find out what goes along with that. And so I walked over to him, and I said, look, I, this might sound a little weird, but I gotta know, what is it that you do for a living that is associated with how handsome you look. I've got to understand that. And he said, I'm an attorney. Oh. Here's what happened in my brain. Eject, eject, eject. Back into the story. Um, is there a particular thing that you practice with, you know, with, within law? I mean, what's your area, area of focus? He said, I practice law. Wow. I'm like, Wow! Okay. In my mind. Eject faster. We haven't done it yet. Okay. Back into the story. So here's what I said. Because I knew he wasn't going to get it. I said, what kind of car do you drive? He said, I drive a bit. I said, yeah, figures. And I turned and walked away. Now, you might say, wow, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? He did that to everybody that night. I watched everyone walk up to him. He did the same thing, and people walked away like, what? Can you believe that guy? He left early, went home in his $200,000 Bentley. He didn't meet anybody that knew. He didn't help anybody. It was a waste of his time. Still has the Bentley. And probably still has the Bentley. Probably two of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? Don't engage with somebody like that. Next slide. 
Here's my final thought. This is my great aunt. She's no longer here anymore. She was 92 at the time, I think, when this picture was taken. She died two weeks shy of her 96th birthday. This is our family store, town shop, 82nd and Broadway on the north side. Sorry. <laughs> Shameless uh, advertisement there. I'm very proud. So, four generations of family have been in the store. The grandson's now take, has taken over. His name is Danny. Um, and the reason that this store has been around for, I think, 120 years at this point mm -hmm. is because she, her thought process was, I'm going to make a difference in every one of my customers' lives. And you might say, how do you do that in a lingerie store? And I will tell you, it is a very intimate thing. And it's very private. And, I'm, and it's just one of those things that she was taking care of great-grandmothers, grandmothers, moms, daughters, four generations at a time, from people all over the country. Remind her, remind you, Victoria's Secrets is across the street. But people didn't go there, they went here. Because of the, the, the work that she did and the caring that she did. She worked six days a week, 10 hours a day, until two weeks shy of her 96th birthday. Her normal day, read the New York Times cover to cover every morning. Make cookies, brownies, cakes, or something for her staff. She was there at 8 o'clock sharp. She worked until 6, right through lunch. Went out to dinner, and then Lincoln Center. About four or five nights a week. For 70 years, she did that. Educated everybody in her family. Traveled the world. And what was her deal? One more. She wanted to make a difference in other people's lives. And she used to say to me, if you make an impact on other people's lives, they'll have a chance to do it for you. Now, thank goodness she's no relation to Ed Koch, but <laughs> one more. She used to say this, too. What will your obituary say about you? Think about it. She used to go to a, a lot of funerals. She helped them pretty much everybody. And she used to walk away saying, I can't believe they were saying all those nice things about them. That's not how I used to know her. I didn't know him like that. But when she passed away, her funeral was a roast of Selma instance. She had a lot of things she used to say. One of the things she used to say is, it's not for me. With a deep New York accent. I can't even uh, imitate her. That was just her thing. It was a roast for her. And I'm telling you, and she still missed. People were just bringing flowers and dropping them at the door for months after she passed away. That's the type of impact I'm trying to do. I'm hoping to do what she did for her customers in my business. And I, it's in my soul. That's what I'm trying to do. And I do it every single day. I hope that you are all thinking I can do the same thing. I'm still aspiring to be as good as she was. She is an absolute mentor for me. We all need people like that, but if you have the chance to make an impact on your clients, on your customers' lives, in some way that's like what she did, that did for her, for her customers, now you've made it. And that's what we're trying to accomplish as a global thing. Doing right is actually a really good thing to do. Um, and I think too many times we get caught up in the money. We get caught up in materialistic things in today's world, and we forget what we're trying to accomplish here, and that's simply make a positive difference. I don't care what your business is, from real estate to making widgets, I don't care. Do something where you're making an impact. Questions? Comments? I know you got a question. Just want to say, everybody, if you have an issue with like looking folks in the eye, because I know that I do for a long time, you look right here between their eyes or at their nose because of where it is. People will think that you're looking them directly in the eye, even though you're not. So it like calms your anxiety. So. And if you really want to throw them off, look at their ear, one of their ears. <laughs> <laughs> They're really self-conscious. Right? right? Like it's really bad. So, like the same point, like, just that book that talked a lot about what you're talking about. Which Great called The Go-Giver, it's a great book, amazingly similar. Um, yep, just in case you didn't these. And then, I do a lot of networking, like at lunch, for mm -hmm. example, so they follow up and I'll sit at lunch, and I always struggle with that a little bit, because you talk about body movement and yep. hands, and 
Have anything to say on that? Yeah, I don't eat. I don't take people out to lunch. I don't go out to lunch with people. You don't want to. Because you're going to be distracted with the food. Well, that's what I want. All I want to know is how can I help you? Tell me more of what I need to know to get to know you, so that I can find a way to help you. That's all I want. I don't want anything else other than to find a way to be able to connect with others that I already know. I can make a difference. I don't have another agenda. The food gets in the way. Someone says, oh, let's get together for a coffee. Mm, how about a caramel? I mean, it's really arbitrary. Well, why don't you just get together and sit on a park Thank bench you. and talk? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Is there no way to get going? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.